Can you try again? Can you hear me now? Online? Hello, Johan. Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Eric. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Thank thanks. You. I'll, I'll start again. Welcome to this session on, on DHS2 in other domains. Uh, we have a packed session with three presenters in 45 minutes. So the presenters have been asked to keep it short. So we have some time for questions. In any case, there is uh, the possibility of writing down questions in the associated uh, community practice page. Uh, so the presenters can um, address your questions, comments later after the session. So the three presenters uh, we have today, we start from uh, Uganda. Er Eric Minambambasi will talk about how DHS2 is used uh, across all sectors in the country to monitor development indicators. Then we'll follow uh, with uh, Leila Ismail based here and also Nadia Semchuk online on um, the use of, of uh, DHS2 for uh, reporting human rights violations. I believe the case is Ukraine. And then lastly, we have Henry Kalisti presenting uh, from Tanzania how uh, DHS2 supports child protection services there. So I'll just then give the word to um, Eric Munyanambasi from his Uganda. Thank you, Johan. Uh, good morning, colleagues, uh, and members in the audience. Um, uh, it's uh, good to be speaking to you about, uh, again, once uh, uh, this uh, uh, use case that we have implemented here in Uganda. Um, in the audience, I have my colleague, Patrick, who I think he's physically attending. Um, so in, as far as questions are concerned, uh, we will be sharing those questions. Um, also, I wanted to note that um, the uh, use case that we will be discussing is a collaborative effort uh, between uh, HISP Uganda and uh, and his Ethiopia. So, yeah, um, we <coughs> uh, been working on uh, on on a use case for e-governance services uh, to foster national development planning uh, using DHIS two. And uh, in here, we we will be discussing um, a number of things uh, from the background to uh, to the implementation and to what is really happening currently. So uh, quickly, um, the national development planning process is uh, um, a, a government endeavor um, that uh, by and large uh, is uh, run by the government uh, of Uganda uh, through the National Planning Authority and uh, supervised by the Office of the Prime Minister. Uh, so with funding from the European Union, uh, the government uh, attempted to take on this activity uh, to develop, um, a, we call it NDP3, because it's the third version of the National Development Plan. Um, so we, we, we refer to it as NDP3, uh, web-based M&A system to monitor uh, planning uh, for the government, both uh, central and, and local. Um, NDP3, like I've mentioned, is a program-based approach to planning, budgeting, and implementation, uh, as well as uh, results reporting, uh, which all of this is really consolidated into a single uh, vision uh, for the country that we call Vision 2040 that has a number of um, activities to be achieved by 2040. Um, the system is built uh, on DHIS2 platform with uh, custom uh, applications uh, covering up to about 20 programs. Uh, these programs are basically made up of the action plans. We call them a program implementation action plans, that is PEPs, 
uh, that specify outcomes, outputs, activities, and the resources required to deliver the different uh, program targets or indicator targets. So it's a really uh, comprehensive uh, M&E uh, framework that addresses planning for the entire government. Um, the technical assistance uh, was focused on enabling efficiency and accurate uh, data uh, entry, uh, exploration, reporting, and analysis for uh, two arms of government. We have the central and the local government. For now, what we've been focusing on has been mainly the central government. Um, the uh, methodology or implementation methodology focused on uh, putting in place um, um, an NDP3, M&E uh, web-based system uh, that is based on uh, national documents. And some of those documents are what we are referencing here. We have um, the third national development plan uh, that goes up to 2025. Um, then the program implementation action plans and also uh, the Uganda Vision 2040, uh, which have uh, specific targets like I've already mentioned. Um, these programs really cover uh, government ministries, departments and agencies all over. Um, and so we focused on uh, putting in place uh, five applications. Um, these applications uh, are by and large custom made because of the complexity and the way the framework uh, for monitoring this program is developed. So we will uh, see the later on that uh, we did go ahead and develop the NDP landing page, which is a summary page that basically uh, gives uh, highlight information on all um, uh, programs, indicators, actions, outputs, outcomes, and so on. Then the target data entry, the performance data entry and results tracking, as well as a document library uh, within DHIS2. We are used to DHIS2 within health, uh, doing a lot of qualitative data, but in, in here, will probably experience the, the idea that, you know, DHIS2 could also be used as uh, to some extent a document repository, partly because uh, when government does something, they want evidence, they want reports, they want pictures, they want images and so on. So, you know, quite really interesting in terms of uh, what um, uh, has been done on this uh, use case. Um, in terms of uh, the products, we, like I've mentioned, uh, we have put in place um, an application uh, based on DHIS2 that uh, summarizes key results, result areas for the uh, program, and then also provide performance figures against targets uh, overall. So what you see um, on this side is really a landing page. Um, uh, which is one of the applications uh, that I mentioned that summarizes data and information. Um, then uh, this uh, screenshot on the uh, right-hand side, lower, also shows a bit of performance um, uh, for different uh, uh, program indicators, objectives, and key result areas. Um, the application allows uh, filters to make user experience dynamic and users can also export uh, reports for further analysis. Um, I also need to reemphasize that the, I, I will keep talking about the application being uh, custom made because it's uh, not part of the DHIS2 core, but these are apps that were uh, custom built to work within DHIS2 as a platform and to provide um, the M&E requirement for, for, for this use case. Then uh, in terms of how data capture uh, is done, um, you'll notice that uh, where we normally have organization units, here we have what we call government uh, votes. And these votes basically list all um, uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. And then in terms of data capture um, for each uh, of the uh, votes, we have created uh, 
uh, the individual data sets for different um, uh, uh, result framework uh, levels where we have outputs, outcomes, and then intermediate results. So we will find that uh, that is the way it's captured. And then for each indicator, um, the teams provide a baseline, a target, and the actual performance uh, per year. And then there are explanatory or uh, attachments, uh, like I mentioned earlier. If, for example, the government plan to build a road and maybe the monitoring team goes there to um, see the progress of the work, they'll take pictures, they'll write reports, and those are the things they'll attach in this section. Um, and that's the little caption below uh, also is the, uh, the extension of when you click in this uh, uh, button, um, you will get a place where you can attach the file and also provide an explanatory note on, on the file that you're attaching. Um, yeah, so we are able to do indicator-based targeting and reporting, and then also provide baselines as well as uh, explanatory notes. Um, out of the data captured, we are able to do dashboards and provide key performance indicators uh, analyzed over time on uh, government interventions as well as uh, indicators. Um, so. Yeah, uh, what has basically come out of uh, this and what we, we are now looking at is that um, uh, due to the scale of the work, we've um, worked on close to 11,300 um, indicators, 5,500 5, uh, groups, uh, data sets, um, and so on. Uh, it's quite a large system because it covers uh, the entire government um, operation and it's also another very good use case. We've done um, a, a lot of capacity building in terms of training, um, uh, close to 263 uh, personnel have been trained and what you see in the breakdown um, is the number of uh, participants or people trained uh, per agency. So we have um, uh, development partners, uh, uh, close to 123 uh, government agencies represented, uh, participants represented, um, and then government ministries, uh, 128, uh, the judicial and parliament, and then public universities. So this is a government-wide um, initiative and also covers quite a really a large scope in terms of training. Yeah, this chart is uh, a, a summary of, of the numbers that we see here. And uh, by and large, you can see that uh, uh, still um, the government MDAs uh, take up a larger part of participation, ownership, and, uh, and, 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 and reporting. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, what would really consider as uh, key success factors, buy-in and full ownership is uh, one of, of these. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this is really supervised by the Office of the Prime Minister uh, with TA uh, uh, through um, the National Planning Authority and also um, uh, Minister of Finance. Then um, we've also shared um, the successes recorded by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education in implementing uh, similar uh, initiatives. And this has also helped. Um, of course, uh, the uh, assurance of uh, local TA technical assistance through his groups has also been very, very key. Uh, to this, um, the flexibility of the platform to generate um, visualizations has also been seen as one of the other uh, success factor. Um, uh, we've mentioned that it, this is really a hundred percent fully uh, owned, and um, the capacity, uh, capacity building is also uh, going to be a hundred percent through government, uh, and then. Uh, ability to integrate with uh, 
other government systems. Uh, I will also take note that uh, we've done integration with IBP. IBP is uh, integrated bank of projects. Um, one of the other uh, government systems that also uh, does uh, the monitoring of uh, government projects. Um, the uh, IFMIS, the PBS, uh, all these are other government projects that will be integrated, but for now, the integration has been with the first one, which is the IBP. Um, there are, of course, been some um, uh, challenges, uh, some of which include uh, uh, the, the, the functionality of the, of the application has mainly been heavily customized due to the complexity of the, of the framework, because the framework is really, really heavily uh, complex and uh, heavily disaggregated. Um, there is also one of the, the other issues that we know uh, as uh, bureaucracy, which has been mainly leading to time wastage. And you find that um, decisions take long, uh, requirements take long to be decided on. Um, and, and that sort of delays in terms of delivering on some of the items. Um, there has been also an issue of limited funding um, because again, uh, governments no longer uh, really in uh, developing countries do not necessarily uh, uh, put uh, quite adequate funding on some of these things. So you find, uh, uh, for example, doing in-person workshops, so trainings cannot easily be conducted due to absence of funding. Um, yeah. Then online training sessions uh, that have been organized before have been uh, um, not uh, very successful, partly because uh, participation is very limited and uh, it's quite also difficult to gauge the participation and the concentration of, of participants on the other side. Yeah, um, then uh, like I mentioned in number two, three, uh, requirements for some of the tax, uh, tasks have also not been well defined and clarified, um, uh, especially where the application require um, uh, programming. And then there are still some considerable quality related issues with indicators and, uh, and, and uh, assigning uh, MDAs. So those are some of the highlighted issues. Um, in terms of lessons learned, um, uh, participation and interest uh, is key uh, for stakeholders, uh, end user perspectives uh, on the development process and quality assurance uh, has been also very, very important. Uh, integrating uh, other uh, elements um, in this uh, initiative has also been important, for example, where um, people have uh, quite related data and indicators that they need to be collected, but rather than run a parallel systems, um, having this integrated in one has been also a, a key. I mentioned the issue of linkages um, with other uh, government related systems, uh, as well as uh, leverage on the uh, expertise in the country. Um, yeah, so these have been really uh, some of the lessons. The initiative is about uh, nine months, no, uh, one year and nine months. And there are some other uh, uh, components that we are still working on, but we do believe that it's one of those uh, success uh, uh, um, uh, in instances and use cases that we have seen, especially outside uh, of the health domain. So in terms of looking forward and where we are, um, we do uh, plan on uh, improving coordination and engaging or engagement with stakeholders. Uh, government has so many stakeholders and um, we only do meet and work with them through the supervising entity, which is the office of the prime minister. And um, yeah, so every time you meet the, this one, then the other one comes up with a new requirement. You meet this one, this one comes with a new requirement. So that uh, is, is an area that we are working to, 
to, to, to solo. Um, then strengthen in-house capacity with fully designated, um, uh, with fully uh, designated to coordinate and uh, to coordinate the development. We are trying to train the, the technical teams at the office of the prime minister and the national planning authority to fully uh, coordinate the development of the, of the system, but also the, the, the training specifically for the government uh, ministries and departments, because not again, not all of them were trained. Uh, we had a representative from 123 uh, ministries and agencies, but we are still, uh, there are still many more that did not participate. And uh, we do think that the best way to, to build capacity and to support them is to really uh, have a core team on the national level that is looking at this and able to scale uh, in terms of support and providing technical assistance. Um, um, we are also uh, reviewing the indicators. They, are, they keep uh, changing the indicators. And like you saw, they are close to 11,000. So whenever they review, uh, a number of those have to change. So it's really a massive undertaking. Uh, and we work with, uh, with the departments and ministries to be able to uh, uh, date um, the changes on indicators and also the, the, the other requested issues. Then uh, we are also working to finalize the development and um, deployment of other key features. Uh, special analytics, they had requested, the team requested for um, uh, a dashboard that they call it a GAPA. Uh, GAPA means Government Annual Performance Reporting Dashboard um, that they want to uh, customize out of the data that is collected through the system. Uh, so we are working on making that one available. And then we are continuing to also support uh, and train users and also create more awareness and use. Yeah, um, I would think that is the end. I will ask maybe, I don't know if Patrick who is in the audience wants to add anything. And thank you, Johan, hopefully um, still within the time, over. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, I'll defer all of you to post your comments and questions. Um, on the community practice page. And then I'll give the word to Leila and uh, Nadia. Hello, can you hear me? Very close, okay. <laughs> I'll try and be as fast as possible. The slide is, uh, the slide deck is available on the shed if you want to catch up on anything if I zoom through a bit too quickly. Is the other notes gonna be on that one? Sorry. Yeah, great. So this presentation is on uh, a program that we're running at Frontline AIDS uh, and the Alliance for Public Health in Ukraine. Um, it's Rights Evidence Action. Uh, my name is Leila Ismail. I'm the Senior Advisor for Monitoring Systems at Frontline AIDS, and my colleague Nadia Semchuk is online and ready to give half of the presentation with me from Ukraine. In case you don't know who we are, um, we were set up in 1993 to work with community groups in the countries most affected by the AIDS pandemic epidemic. <laughs> um, today, we work as a partnership um, in more than 40 countries, taking local, national, and global action on HIV health and human rights. Um, we're a global partnership that's open to everyone, and we're working with partners from grassroots community groups right through to national governments. The REACT program itself, uh, I won't go through this now, but you can look at the slide later, um, was built in response to increasing stigma, discrimination, and criminalization of people living with HIV and other marginalized populations. It's a community-based human rights monitoring and response system. It stands for Rights, Evidence, and Action. And it's designed for civil society organizations to document data about human rights violations, as well as providing and referring clients to health, legal, and other public services, uh, but also using the data collected to inform quality human rights-based HIV programming, as well as policy and advocacy at national, regional, and global levels. 
Um, this is the illustration of the project, but I'll let you explore that later. Uh, this is a DHIS2 conference, so of course, uh, we built it in DHIS2. Um, it's what we're using for the data documentation side of the project. Uh, we've named our instance Wonder, so if I keep referring to Wonder, that's why. Uh, we named it after uh, Wonder Fox, who was a trans rights activist from Colombia. Um, having the data in DHIS2 allows us to do relatively easy monitoring and analysis of the human rights data. We use quant quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and it's to inform programming, to evidence for advocacy, to influence decision makers, and used for evidence in bids and proposals to resource human rights programs, amongst other things. This is kind of what it looks like. It's tracker capture, pretty straightforward, um, client information and case information. Um, it's based on a generic template, which we then customize for each country who are using it. They might want to customize it depending on their programming, depending on who they're reaching in, in terms of populations. Um, but from the frontline aid's perspective, we really would like to be able to review all of the data across countries at a global level. Um, so we do want to keep it as a template with similarities across all the programs we, we run. Um, for example, at the moment, we're looking particularly at the role of police as a perpetrator to do a global human rights report. Um, this means that we want to ensure wherever possible our data elements and our indicators are standardized uh, across all countries. Uh, what we've done with it so far, um, since it's been on DHIS2 since 2019, uh, there's some stats here I'll let you read through later, um, but I'm going to go straight down to this bottom one, which is our partners Alliance for Public Health, APH in Ukraine have successfully migrated to their own instance of DHIS2. And that's what we wanna talk about today, the sustainability of the model and of the program and how we can go from uh, an organization being in our instance of DHIS2 to then owning their own. Um, it's really encouraging for us to see this kind of thing um, from a sustainability and a localization point of view. Um, so what are the benefits of organizations hosting their own instance? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. They'll have total control over the program design and governance. Um, they will have complete ownership and sharing of the data. Of course, they're always going to own their own data. We, we make that clear, but um, complete ownership and sharing. There's additional options to use DHIS2 for other programs. We use it for other programs ourselves in service delivery programs, et cetera. Um, it can really strengthen internal capacity in an organization. And it's good for our agenda of localization and program sustainability overall. Um, a quick slide about the process of it. APH uh, piloted React in our instance of Wonder for one year, and they recorded about 2,000 cases, which may not sound like a lot, but it was a really good uh, feat and achievement. So based on the success, they decided to set up their own instance of DHIS2 independently of us. Um, the people that were involved were, were frontline aides, BAO, who's in the room, and uh, APH themselves. So BAO were setting up the new system based on the configuration of our wonder. Um, and they also had to migrate all the existing data from the system into the new instance. Um, it began in late 2020, went live at the start of 2021. So it didn't take that long to do. But some key considerations. APH were already an exceptional partner who had strong capacity in running monitoring systems. They have been uh, using Cyrex since before DHIS2. Um, we've tried this process with a couple of other organizations. It hasn't always been this easy or successful. So we'll point out this is definitely a good practice uh, story. Um, but we're gonna hope to share some of our lessons learned. I'm gonna hand over now to Nadia to talk us through the next challenges. Are you there, Nadia? You're muted, I think. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Leila. Good afternoon, dear participants. Um, so Leila just uh, briefly said about the process we had, and uh, actually it was time and expertise consuming, consuming and uh, we want to share with you some challenges and advice as well that we faced uh, during the process. Um, so the process of existing data migration have, had uh, to be kept uh, really carefully at all the stages. 
uh, for some period of time, all the all of the current users of the system were disabled and uh, restricted to enter new data. Uh, so this is what's done for us uh, to finish the um, the process of data migration and uh, fully test uh, the new instance. Uh, as for now, data is no longer all in one system. So for frontline aides who would like to keep some oversight for all React program, it is important to keep good uh, communication and sharing if um, we want to combine data use for global uh, advocacy activities, for example. Another challenge uh, that should be mentioned, it is budget. So you should consider that the cost of setting up a new instance is definitely would be much higher than sharing um, such costs within uh, several programs. And uh, among other challenges, it is uh, um, the process of creating uh, the analytic objects like uh, program indicators and dashboard. So we had to create them from scratch. So it, it also took uh, some time for that. But anyway, we could advise, uh, we could provide you with uh, some advice. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. yeah, sorry for this. Uh, so some advice for other organizations uh, thinking of creating their own instance. Um, so first of all, uh, really have a plan prepare a plan of steps, uh, involved staff, uh, both internal and external, and consider a budget uh, that needed while setting up the system. Make sure that you have uh, enough uh, internal technical capacity and uh, it is uh, really about internal as it is more beneficial to have than external. However, you also should consider some budget for additional system administrator training. Also evaluate your needs in using the system, like setting configuration, using languages, using the system within different countries and contexts, and if possible, consider it further expansion and scale uh, at the early stage or at the, uh, at the middle, if that possible. Also, it would be a good idea uh, to have piloting on an existing system. It could be beneficial before investing uh, in your own instance. Spend enough time for testing the system and its revision. We do spend a lot of time in testing and revision, and this process was done and again and again. Um, and maybe this is the reason why, why we succeed in that. So be patient with that. Also consider the server location in terms of proven security and data protection issues and maintain resources. So um, our service uh, were uh, under the maintenance of BIO systems and we decided to have them um, at, the, at the same place. And we, uh, um, we defined that it was for, uh, it was a good decision. Also, uh, keep fundamental data elements unified between instances. So it is for you uh, for further um, collation or standardizing something or comparison data elements or data you actually receive. Um, and uh, also, it is a good idea to have some basic uh, standardized data indicators also uh, for you to compare the data you have. Um, and with all of this, for sure, make an ongoing monitoring of the system functionality and response. So uh, it is needed to do for several times for us during, during the whole process of data migration. Um, so having said that, um, uh, next slide. It's been a year and a half uh, that APH having its own uh, DHS2 instance and how it looks today. What are the results we have so far? 
So we have more than 10,000 cases registered in the system. And uh, the cases were registered in 13 countries so far under APH management. Uh, more than 170 NGOs implementing React, and we have more than 300 users so far. But uh, the system is growing, and new countries, new users um, are creating. Having shown such results, we constantly doing regular monitoring of uh, external and internal program needs, and this facilitate the program, the prompt response to program changes and requests. Um, also, we spent uh, a lot of time to ensure data quality in the system, and uh, it is possible through continual trainings for users and providing them guidance in interactive forms like um, online trainings, video, and so on. As a result, we have a reliable source for advocacy actions in implementing countries, so the data produced during uh, within our DHS2 instance is uh, fully used and it is a reliable source. Um, and also it is important to share the results we have uh, through different platforms like being here and uh, sharing at another platforms. Next slide. Um, we are inviting you to take a look at our React data portal, uh, where we actually have statistics, uh, success stories of response, reports, examples of advocacy actions taken using the data from our DHS2 instance and much more. Please use the QR code you can see on the screen to enter the website, or you can uh, find the presentation uh, and to look through this later. The presentation is available on the web page of this um, session on DHS2 conference website. Um, that's all. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or need any support or advice in setting up your own DHS2 instance, uh, we are here with Leila to answer your questions or provide some assistance, or you can reach us later after the conference. Can still speak to the audience here. The last speaker will be Henry from Tanzania uh, on integrated child protection management using DHS2. All right. Right. Good morning. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to be very brief so that I can spend at least the the remaining time, which is less than five minutes probably, just to take you through uh, another area that uh, DHS2 can find it uh, very interesting and necessary to explore, uh, where I'm going to present uh, a particular use case uh, in district case monitoring system in Tanzania, which uh, look forward to integrated child protection management uh, using the DHS2. So uh, my name is Henry Kalisti. Of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues Lillian and uh, Dr. Hones Kimaro, as well as Happiness Nyanda, uh, who worked together in putting out, uh, putting this together for sharing. Um, Yeah. 
now it's working. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Uh, of course, child protection is the responsibility of uh, every member in of course, any society. Uh, and through different policies, the government of Tanzania has also committed uh, to improving and securing well-being of a uh, child. Of course, through this, it has established the various policies. Among those policies are uh, the National Coast State Plan of Action for Most Vulnerable Children, uh, to, uh, we, as well as the National Plan of Action to End the Violence Against Women and Children. And all these policies mostly aimed to mitigate uh, the negative impact of uh, various aspects, including the issue of child neglect, child aid, and forced marriage, and violence against children, one way or another. But along with those policies, it has also implemented a national integrated case management uh, system framework, which aim to harmonize uh the the processes around the implementation of uh, child protection uh aspects so uh despite of uh, the existence of this of course along with this of course the government has uh, established a ministry very specific for community development uh gender women and special groups which is uh, directly responsible for dealing with uh, social welfare aspects, including uh, child protection. But along with that, it has also another ministry, which is uh, President Office. It has another ministry, which is the President uh, PRH, that is the President Office, Regional Administration, and Local Government Authority which is responsible for implementation of all the policies that has been established by the ministry responsible for that. So uh, despite, of course, the existence of all these initiatives, still child protection issues has been happening and more intervention definitely are required by various authorities. So while these efforts are in place, of course, uh, there is a need for information related to all these uh, initiatives uh, that are being implemented to be uh, well organized to ensure data driven planning and decision uh, making so there was a lot of existing initiatives including the government establishing appropriate regulations and tools in place that are supposed to be used during the uh, provision of these services and documentation uh, most of them being paper tools. Of course, a Microsoft Access database was also uh, somehow established, but most of this becomes, they were not efficient enough and probably not sustainable enough, uh, especially considering the, the geographical area as well as demographic of the country. So just to give you a hint on, uh, Tanzania is uh, located in East Africa and it has a total area of uh, 9, 945,000 with administrative areas uh, which include 26 regions, 184 councils, and a good number of wards as villages. So uh, the population was projected to be 57 by 2020. And among this population, you can see the young population was um, 43, about 43 percent, and of course the youth, 15 to 24, was uh, 50, 99, more than 99 percent. Basically, this is based on the uh, NBS, which is the National Bureau of Statistics, and we are based on the last census conducted in 2012. Of course, we are expecting to have another census this year. So, considering these uh, uh, settings. Of course, most of the uh, issues related to child protection, they happen in the villages, of course, from the community, and they can originate from, uh, from the household being reported by either the child himself, him or herself, or probably anyone in the community, or it can be institution within the community, but mostly they will engage some uh, village executive officers. But at the end, the law requires social welfare to be uh, uh, directly engaged to any child protection matters, who has to, of course, initiate 
the file and handle the case until the child gets the required uh, protection. However, of course, social welfares are mostly available at national level, region level, as well as districts. Very few wards has social welfare so far, and most of the village do not have at all. But there exists, of course, uh, an engagement of the community workers who mostly are connected, coordinated by partners working closely in the rural areas, of course, I mean, in the villages or streets uh, to provide these uh, social welfare services. Just uh, some facts and figures that were based on UNICEF Tanzania uh, 2017 Child Protection Fact Sheets. Actually, these are the one which led to the implementation of um, this system in one or another. You can see more than twice of all number of uh, girls than boys experience some form of sexual violence before turning 18 in Tanzania. And basically, orphans are more vulnerable to sexual and emotional abuse. But the interesting fact was that uh, domestic violence is was somehow widely accepted by even women than men. And considering the fact also that almost 60% of women aged 25 to 49 years were married before the age of 18 by then. So those were just some hint on the facts in the ground to show uh, the, uh, the concern in place. So when there was all these issues being uh, discussed, the concern was also on how then the data monitoring could be done in order to inform the uh, planned decision making and of course, uh, UNICEF, while working with the government, uh, uh, get to us just to know what kind of technology could help uh, to improve the situation. That's where we found DHS2 being somehow useful, uh, considering the fact that we were leveraging on the existing system. By then, uh, all these services was, were offered by a same ministry, which was the Ministry of Health. Uh, so, given that the Ministry of Health has already implemented DHS2 in most of the aspects and the similarities between those uh, two services, we found it necessary to build on existing install base. Uh, also, the potential of linkage of all other social welfare services around within the same platform, uh, ease of scale up and extend, of course, to engage the rest of the other services the potential of uh, integrating it with other system as well as linkage with partners around. And of course, most importantly, the power of uh, influencing data-driven decision-making, which comes with the DHS2. All these factors uh, uh, made us, of course, believe uh, DHS2 could be the right platform to be used to support those initiatives. So we went on and come up with the design that was aiming to uh, incorporate, of course, a tracker module that could, of course, trace or track uh, all child protection concerns. So for every case, uh, there was some, of course, necessary agreed variables and stages that were supposed to be captured because, of course, there are, there are many aspects that they are always filed through the case. But of course, given the resources around the number of social welfares, so we had to choose only the minimal number of uh, variables that of course were necessary also for, for data use uh, aspect. So you can see uh, on the DCMS side, those are the stages and potential variables that were considered to be captured for any cases that is judged from the when it is reported in investigations up to the point it is uh, closed. So this is the tracker model within DHS2, and then the rest would be benefiting from the analysis that comes with the features in DHS2. So this is an example of just a dashboard that was uh, put in place, and mainly it was trying to answer some comparison uh, based on uh, children living in a street versus child protection concerns, because of course, within the same system, as you may notice, there is also aggregate data for most vulnerable children being captured. And the, uh, child protection are part of the most vulnerable uh, children. So for instance, 
this was basically a dashboard trying to compare and see uh, the relationship between the children living in the streets versus those who uh, got the child protection uh, concerns. Um, so this is the scorecard as well that was implemented in order to, uh, to, to in, in order to simplify management uh, decisions and try, try to enforce accountability around the system. So among the achievements, of course, is having the just user-friendly DHS2 tracker capture. Uh, and we managed, I mean, this started as a pilot, of course, in selected district in 2017, but by March 2021, uh, the, it was rolled out to the entire country. So uh, the rollout was done in phases and a bit delayed because of resources. But of course, in average, I would say more than 2,000 cases are reported through this MS every year. And the DHS2 core analysis tools are widely used uh, for an data use and analysis and data use purpose. So this map is actually showing the reality that all districts are now reporting uh, child protection concern through the DHS2. So what is more interesting out of this uh, is the fact that when we started, our vision was to also make use of DHS2 uh, to improve the data collection and, and, and of course, use within the social welfare. And we started, of course, with the child, I mean, with most vulnerable children concern and, and the child protection. But our vision was, of course, to see it including all other services around. And lucky enough, the existence of this system has actually spearheaded the vision that the ministry now have to integrate uh, all social welfare services within the system. Of course, this includes different aspects in social welfare. And as I'm speaking, of course, the government is uh, in its initiative to start, of course, engaging stakeholders, coming up with the requirements for this comprehensive system. And they are looking much forward for the DHS2 to play a very important role in this. Of course, the challenge has been of uh, availability of resources. They are really banking on some technical uh, assistance on the implementation of uh, DHS2. Uh, but unfortunately, not so many partners are interested in everything in social welfare, probably a very specific aspect, mostly in child protection. But for them, they want to achieve a comprehensive thing within DHS2. So we believe this is an opportunity uh, for, for, for providing the technical assistance at least stage to establish DHS2 within the social welfare uh, sector as an intention. Started. Um, well, again, I I, uh, I think I'll feel to add any comments or questions to the community of practice page. Um, unless you have some comments now and you're not eager to join the other sessions, because there are, we have this room, there are no other sessions taking place here. If there are from online or on site. Okay, thanks again to all three presenters.